So I, I would like that, and I like the um, the crossings between the, the different uh, ways of, of uh, making things. And I guess it's also from, uh, I think the theater reminds me a lot of church, and we were talking about community yesterday and, and just thinking of live uh, events, and um, there's a liveness in music that I think is fully emotional um, when, uh, someone they always say when I, when someone can't speak anymore they just break into song and uh, there's a guy who teaches a lot of composer librettist workshops um, in Minneapolis it's called Nautilus and his name is Bren Ben Crywatts and I, I think a lot of us have taken his workshops through New Dramatis and he says uh, talks about emotional expansion and I think that that's really useful in theater because um, I I don't really like the sound of actors projecting. I think that's what I hear when I don't when I hear a play that's a cappella most of the time. Um, but I um, but I think that there are plays that don't have music that are very operatic to the ear, like uh, more stately mansions at New at uh, New York Theater Workshop didn't have accompaniment at all. But um, when I saw it, I really felt that it was an opera because of its emotions and the way it was scored. Um, so I think you can do that with um, theater. And you can also, uh, something that I've done a lot is uh, to work on something with music and with a composer and then later take the music away and it then has the print of uh, the musicality and the language. So um, I, I hope I answered the question. Very good. <laughs> Kim, what about you? Um, I started acting, dancing, singing uh, very young at age 12 and was part of a theater company that, that did original musicals commissioned um, by like Liz Suedos and Steven Schwartz and had a ball doing that and then went into college and studied and always knew that acting was my favorite and expressing and dealing with the people and their intentions and their desires and their conflicts was my favorite thing so I thought I'm just going to concentrate on the acting and I studied acting for four years and then upon getting out um, it wasn't as multi-culty aging myself in 1988 <laughs> um, and so ethnic, all ethnicities were encouraged to audition it said on the notices but we were barely ever cast and I was considered ethnic um, so and they knew I sang so my advisor was pushing me to go into musicals, go into musicals, and so I found myself working with an agent, and uh, he just kept sending me out for Anita and West Side Story <laughs> all over the place, and um, then I, I managed on my own to get cast in Hair, the musical, which is a really fun musical, and I did the European tour of that, and fun songs <laughs> to do, and blah, 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 but I, it really, I kind of suffered by the end, and I felt like it really hurt my acting chops because it was all about fun song and then poignant ballad and then la la la. And um, so after that, I thought, I don't want to keep on going out for these musicals. I want to do theater. And luckily, I got connected with Ruth and in the whole downtown <coughs> theater scene and started doing what is still one of my favorite things to do is theater with music. Mm -hmm. And um, it often means that the whole play is driven by the characters and their desires and their stories and their conflicts. And like, exactly like Ruth said, that they, they burst into song because they can't speak anymore and they have to sing it out. And, and I just love that because in the songs then really further the intentions and the conflicts and the story of the character so I got to play these crazy ass great characters that <laughs> Ruth um, wrote and got to sing and got to do a little dancing and um, and um, yeah, and so that's that's what I still long for. I, I love in the in theater pieces with music, I love feeling the audience when suddenly the character does have to sing, you feel the audience just kind of, oh, oh, and they listen even more intently and and it really furthers um, the script along and serves the script and the text and the story and the characters. So that's how I got into it. Mark? It's interesting because I, I have a, somewhat of a similar background 
to Ruth in that uh, I think about my early influences. Uh, people ask me, well, wh what are your two early influences um, or earliest memories of music? And um, one is chant in the, in the church. And then the other was I, I grew up here, uh, but I can remember when I was, um, gosh, maybe four or five, going to a powwow up um, towards Niobrara. And this was um, the, uh, not the Ogallala Sioux tribe, but, but um, and maybe one of the Omaha tribes. And <clears throat> I can remember getting out of the car and hearing the sound of drums, you know, in the distance. And I'm like, and then getting closer and closer and closer and just feeling the energy of that. Uh, the sound of the drums and how where is that and I want to see that and so so um, from a very early age I wanted to be a drummer um, and really to play these big powwow drums but when growing up in the Midwest it, before you can study any other instrument at least where I grew up in Lincoln you had to um, st study piano for at least a year and so um, I stu studied piano and I continued I started about the same age well maybe a little older than you, but maybe, you know, <laughs> like second grade. And then, and then I continued with that my musical st studies um, throughout uh, um, all the way to high school and, and then became um, initially a music major and an English major at the same time. Um, started in, in college really exploring the connection, and I, and I, and I did, oh, by the way, you know, a lot of musical theater in high school like you do, you know, and, and so as frightening as it is to Mary Beth, I did <laughs> act at one point in, in um, um, so, uh, but, but then I became really fascinated, you know, with um, a continuing use of percussion and voice. So I was influenced by, you know, John Cage, um, Harry Parch, Meredith Monk, people like this um, were, uh, I was listening to as well as um, a lot of avant-garde jazz. Um, <clears throat> when I got to graduate studies at University of Iowa um, as a composition student, um, I, at, that was the time when I tell, say, this is the um, like Tom Waits said, at one point I went down the black hole of percussion and I never came out again. Um, so I was do I, I started um, building all of these percussion instruments and from found objects and creating sound sculptures and then I wanted to combine that with these kind of extended vocal techniques and forms. But I was finding, I was also at that time um, to support myself I was teaching um, ear training, what I call um, ear straining and sight swinging to um, uh, the theory students. Um, but I was finding that there was this resistance among music, uh, you know, class, sort of classically trained music students um, uh, to doing these extended vocal techniques and just experimenting and improvising. And so I thought, well, gosh, where I know that people in theater, you know, at least this is my experience when I was in theater, have this sort of yes and um, mentality. So I went to the theater department, University of Iowa, um, and uh, and took some pieces over there and began experimenting. And that's that was my that's that's how I began to start doing a lot of work in theater. And then when people found out that I could accompany live, um, I could uh, add um, music as a percussionist, as a pianist, um, then. I went down the black hole of theater and <laughs> stayed there, and so um, that's uh, my impulse. Really came out of you know out of a practical uh, search to find collaborators who were willing to take risks in the music that they were doing, um, and then I just became fascinated with the process of how music and sound can propel storytelling in a in a kinetic w way. Very good. Um, if, if Ruth and Kim could talk a little bit. They've collaborated together, so I, if you guys could talk a little bit about a project that you worked on and how music was used in that, that would be great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, what was so cool about working with Ruth and director Tim Maynard, producer Kristen Marting, and, and part of Tiny Mythic Theater Company composer Matthew Pierce, um, Tiny Mythic went on to start here Art Center in New York City, mm -hmm. which some of you may know. 
Um, but the exciting thing about working with Ruth is often day one of rehearsal, she'd come in with her script with no music written yet. And she'd say, I, I kind of hear this part as a song and, um, and this part here. And um, why don't we just run through it and uh, Kim, see, see what you think, see what, see what you can do. And you know, that sounds pretty <laughs> nerve wracking. <laughs> but she'd give me a little guidance and sometimes she'd point out a phrase or a word and she said, this, this word here is really important to me, so maybe elongated or da 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 da. So again, it was like totally character you know, um, intention and conflict driven and, um, and oftentimes, um, you know, and when you do something like that, it's, it, it was freeing, it's scary, but freeing in a way because it's not about, I got to make this sound really good. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's about what is this character going through right now and what does she need to say and what does she need to express and what does she want. And so we'd often play around with that. And um, one show um, uh, in particular, I did a little piece of it in Fringe the other night, Centaur Battle, Battle of San Jacinto. Um, uh, the composer was Nikos Briscoe, and we were, he, when it came to those little monologues and songs, that uh, he had some ideas for chords and he'd say, you know, I'm kind of hearing maybe these chords here and these chords there and da, da 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 And then I'd look at the piece and see what was going on with the character and then we would just riff with it. And even by the time it opened at Dixon Place, a lot of it wasn't set, mm -hmm. you know? We, <laughs> we would maybe set, okay, we're gonna switch then to um, these chords here and this will be like the chorus and, um, but, um, and then we'd sometimes just set certain lines to, to help the other cast members too, to give them some kind of guidelines of where we were in the song. And um, but it, was, it was very, very freeing and, um, um, and a little terrifying at times. I, I often tell the story of when I did Ruth's show, Night Vision, which was a vampire opera, <laughs> and <laughs> it was about uh, a va uh, Iraqi vampire rock star woman, <laughs> um, and the music was composed by avant-garde saxophonist Fred Ho, mm. rest in peace, Fred. Brilliant, brilliant man. And so the, the I think the first thing we did with it is we had a staged reading at the public, <laughs> and it was packed, and what was I, 26, 27, 28, like, or, yeah, I was like 28, 29. <coughs> and, um, and so, uh, again, none of the music was written, maybe one song, but the rest not, and here I was playing this vampire, Iraqi vampire rock star who had to sing Ruth's words, which if you know Ruth's words are pretty wild sometimes, <laughs> um, while Fred improvised on tenor saxophone in front of the huge public theater. Um, so, uh, <laughs> and I just went over to Fred's one day and he was like, you know, I'm gonna, I don't know, I'm gonna play around and do something like <laughs> You just come in whenever you want and la la la. <laughs> oh, so I remember sitting in the green room backstage like, oh my God, you know, I'm just going to make a huge fool out of myself. Blah, 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 blah. But then, you know, to bring myself back down, I said, no, Kim, you know, y y again, it's about the character. It's not about how great I'm going to sound or how sweet that part's going to sound or how meaty or whatever. It's about the character and the words and, um, and what she's going through in that moment and about especially just being completely open and ears open, heart open, mind open, and just connect the character and the words and trust. And if I didn't hear anything, I would just wait. And then, um, it, yeah, super scary, but super rewarding in the end and freeing. Um, uh, yeah, ooh, I just got on a long okay. story there. <laughs> Ruth, do you have anything yeah. to add to that? You forgot about the two hearts that you had swallowed in your throat. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. so like, not, not only did I have to sing, I, I had two hearts in my throat. <laughs> Ultimately, she was supposed to sing in two tones. So when we went to production, there was a second voice 
on the side of the stage singing with her, so she sounded like she had two tones. Um, and I had to keep Tube in mind, chanting. sorry? Tube chanting, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I, I had to keep in mind the Iraqi flair. Yeah. So I was listening to all this Iraqi music. Yeah. <laughs> so I could somehow sound Iraqi when mm -hmm. I was doing all this. It was a lot of components, but, but very freeing. And again, about the words and the characters and the story. And the, so. the, the hearts were a third world and a, a first world heart, and so um, they were, um, the vampire was transfusing, and uh, she was a an, uh, metaphor for capitalism. So um, that was, Kim and I worked together mostly during my cry pitch phase, I would call it, my yeah. cry pitch years. <laughs> yeah. I was obsessed with this idea of a, a cry pitch, and um, so it was, Someone told me that the voice, you can tell where your voice breaks as to where you've had trauma. And so I was very interested in that. And mm -hmm. also there was a time when I was making a video when I was in grad school and I had always sung alto in church. And so I was always singing under the melody and always had been told I was an alto. And when I was uh, just performing for myself and the video camera, I started to experiment and uh, my voice went everywhere. It went way all over the place. And I was really inspired by that breaking open and I wanted to, f I wanted other actors to be able to feel that and, and to explore it. And I, um, you know, a lot of uh, singers won't do that to their voice because they're afraid they're gonna hurt their vocal cords. Right. And, and I think there's ways of doing it without damaging yourself and, and uh, but, uh, so the Cry Pitch Carols was another piece that <coughs> Kim did, and she played the Bible smuggler's wife, and uh, there was a small, small Christus who would explode his manger. Um, and uh, so it was basically a nativity operetta set in a nostalgic nuclear cold winter. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so yeah. the, the Cry Pitch was kind of, if you can imagine, a rupture through uh, Christmas Carol. So I was using Christmas Carols to inspire the way I wrote the songs and the sounds. Matthew Pierce is a, um, now he's in working for the ballet, but um, a classically trained violinist. And so he was writing things that could sound like Christmas Carols. And then there would be this rupture that would cry out through it. And that came also from working with punk bands where punk singers are, you know, not worried about their vocal cords at all. So yeah. <laughs> or their ears. They, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, a couple punk bands that I worked with in Austin, I wanted to have older women singing the vocals. And so we had punk bands with like 70 year old women. <laughs> it was very hard to find actors willing to uh, hear all the noise in the background of their beautiful vocals. vocals. So, um, uh, but the cry pitch lasted for a long time. And I, in fact, when I think about music, I have a couple drawings that I've worked on over the years and I return to them sometimes and try to think of like, what is the architecture of the kind of voice that I'm interested in? And um, I've written a couple blogs for um, TCG, one of which is called um, toward a neo-cubist alamkara vocal art for playwriting. Mm -hmm. And so I think of the voice as cubist and as, as uh, language and theater as a cubist kind of um, art form. And I'm very interested in showing something that is has a flatness like theater does, but also has multiple points of view within it. And I think that's also feminist and um, anti-capitalist, I guess you could say, because <laughs> uh, capitalism is all about a single message and one person, you know, dominating. So to have multi-vocals and multi-linearity, to have um, that kind of multiplicity is really political to me and also feminist and um, interesting. So I'm interested in this idea of the voice as, as cubist, and so the cry pitch is a part of that, and I would say that's the, the most uh, foregrounded kind of voice because when you have when you meet someone who is in that kind of emotional poverty they um, are very desperate and they sound broken and and so they're very usually very close to you but then as you go into the kind of hor the horizontal linearity of the space those are everyday events and could be even realistic events but then in the background there would be affluence and um, people that are doing really well and don't really need you, so they've gone off into the distance. Um, so um, 
A couple other things I'm working on are um, locket areas. It's another piece that, that uh, came out of this opera project time that Kim was a part of. And when I look back on that time, I really feel that we were fortunate to um, be bold enough to just make what we were making. And we didn't have a 501c3. We didn't have a commission. We didn't have really anything but our own bravery. <coughs> and it lasted until everybody started getting scared because the reviews were like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> 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 and, uh, and my parents were like, what the hell is that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then um, everybody scattered into more commercial things, except for Kim and I, really, and, and Kristen. Yeah. So, uh, but um, during that time, I wrote these pieces with Kristen Marting uh, for a piece that she brought me into called The Courtesan, and mm. I had written them as locket arias, and now I've returned to them, and by accident, a composer in uh, Minneapolis, I sent them to him as a reference for something he was working on, and he started scoring them, and he just worked for three months straight and just scored them at, for opera singers, and so I'm really excited about um, seeing them this way, and I heard all of them for the first time uh, in April with uh, six beautiful Minneapolis um, opera singers, and I can't wait to s keep working on it and finding uh, maybe little interstitial kind of scenes between them. Um, and then uh, I'm working on Previously Blue, which is more of an acoustic a cappella kind of piece, but I'm actually performing in it and thinking of it as uh, spoken singing, so it goes between speaking and, and singing, mm. and it's mm. uh, <coughs> very percussive in the background, but minimalist, I think, as well, and it's <laughs> I'm working with uh, Da Theater, who are there, uh, as I was mentioning yesterday, my sisters in Belgrade, Serbia, <coughs> and they're very physical, and they actually have inspired me a lot to think about um, the voice. They talk about it as resonators, like they uh, take this from Grotowski and Eugenio Barba, and they have trained themselves physically so that they can resonate their voice from different parts of their body, and so it's wonderful to work with them even though they aren't singers. They're very understanding of all the ranges of the voice. And then uh, another piece that is, um, we're s just trying to get it off the ground, it's uh, called The Passion of Layla, and I'm thinking of it as a Tazier opera, um, inspired by the form of Tazier, but uh, won't be traditional Tazier at all, but um, I'm working on that with Richard Marriott in uh, um, San Francisco. San Francisco. Um, so those are some things I'm working on now, but it really comes from that work that Kim and I did, and I'm, I'm so lucky to have the honor of working with a performer like Kim because she's just like a genius. <laughs> oh my, <laughs> I, can't I love this she's conference. Not, I can't believe she's not, uh, <laughs> 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 And of course, so Ruth's a genius. <laughs> um, I wanted to move us, and I'll let Mark lead with this, because Mark and Ruth have both um, done work uh, using music as a, a tool or a means to begin an intercultural uh, collaboration with artists from other cultures. So Mark, could you talk, begin by talking a little bit about your experience um, interculturally? Yeah, it, you know, and I, I would l lead that by saying that the fascinating thing to me always in working on a new, new plays or established plays is an, um, the opportunity to explore an entirely different musical world than I know um, and and opening up and learning about uh, a different world. So, um, early an example of that uh, was when I did um, Kentucky Cycle uh, at Iowa before it transferred um, to uh, the Kennedy Center and to Broadway. And interestingly, we have somebody in the house who was in that. Um, Libby Lee Simon was in that right uh, uh, production, but um, it really led me down the path of exploring the music of Appalachia and then um, that whole, you know, what imagining what the, uh, the sound of uh, America was be before um, the industrialization happened. Um, and, and so uh, in, I, ex I explored that, create, you know, learned a lot of songs, learned new instruments, a hammer dulcimer, lap dulcimer, and so, um, so that was, that's one of the fascinating things for me in doing theater is it takes me down in different musical journeys. 
the, uh, one of my mo favorite projects uh, that we did that was an intercultural exchange um, also started at the University of Iowa with uh, Cambodian poet Usam Ur and poet Ken McCullough. Um, Usam Ur had a um, book of poetry called Sacred Vows, but when I met Sam uh, and his friend Ken McCullough, um, it, he had just come back sort of uh, uh, on a grant from, from Cambodia. Uh, his friend Ken McCullough met him during, uh, when they were at the International Writing Workshop in 1968, and then Sam went back and was, uh, was in Cambodia when the Khmer Rouge took over. So um, he actually survived by, uh, he had to burn all his poetry. He broke his glasses. He broke his glasses, be, um, buried actually all of his poetry as the Khmer Rouge was descending on Phnom Penh. Um, and his friend Ken, who they were very close, didn't, hadn't heard from him in, in years and had a beautiful poem about uh, they used to joke about um, people eating dog meat in, in Cambodia. And he had this beautiful poem about uh, thinking about Usam Moore, you know, whether he was still alive or that whether he was dog meat in the um, Khmer Sun. And then they got this letter out of, out of the blue, uh, somebody requesting their thesis uh, uh, in Cambodia. So um, Sam came, and uh, if you know... If anybody's heard Khmer poetry, it's it's sung, all sung. And um, Sam had a grant to come to the University of Iowa, and uh, I did the uh, first. He had he, Ken knew me because of work we had done together in so settings of his poetry, and um, Ken said, "Well, or Sam said, I need accompaniment, you know." And I'm like, "I I don't know, play any." Khmer instruments, and he says, oh, well, we'll just come, he came over to my basement, I said, well, I have, like, these transmission gears that sort of sound like the, the Kong Tum, and he says, oh, those are great, so I'd, I'd play those, and and I have these flutes that sound a little bit like a Cambodian instrument, a paipak, um, and so we did a reading of his uh, sacred vows, and... Um, what fascinated me at that time, when we first did that reading, we practiced, and I had a synthesizer as well, which was, which, you know, um, so not an instrument, except for with the, the mod wheel, I could sort of change pitch. But we're, we're doing this reading, and all of a sudden, his pitch starts shifting up as he's singing. And I'm like, oh, I can't go there because I don't have like a trombone that can slide, I don't have a violin, you know? And, and so I was kind of moving the mod wheel slightly. And I come to find out in, in Khmer singing that um, they, th there's, it's a little bit like you, you talk about with the cry pitch, but that, that their voices, the, the part of the aesthetic is their voices slightly ascend. So as they're as, as ascending towards infinity. So there's always this slightly tuning up. And after we did that initial reading, Sam said, you know, I really see this as, as, uh, as a theater piece, or we talked about that, Mary Beth and I, and then um, uh, so we began a collaboration on, well, how do we turn this piece into something, how do we take this to the stage? And we created this chamber opera called um, Croissant Tree, and Mary Beth can talk a little bit more about it, but the beautiful thing of, of, of that was, when we first did it, I was as a workshop, we put out a call for all, you know, um, uh, a Asian American students, we didn't care. There, there was some, some a Hmong community in Iowa. There was n no um, Cambodians other than Usam Moore there at that time. Um, but it was a beautiful, it was a beautiful experience in Iowa to begin with, because uh, all of the Asian American students were in the room together, and they said this is the first time we've ever been in a room together, creating a piece of theater that is a, about our culture. Not even just creating a, a piece of theater. They said it was the first time they'd been in a room together with just other people like them. Um, and we had one young woman that came to us and she said, I can't sing or I can't dance, but I was in a refugee camp and I need to be a part of this. Uh, we then took the piece to, I'm, I'm gonna mm -hmm. move quickly. Um, 
shorter amount of words than Mark. We, we, <laughs> we moved uh, the piece quickly uh, to Minneapolis St. Paul, which we had funding from the St. Paul Company and various other organizations. And Theater de la Jeune Lune invited us to be able to uh, work on the piece there and present it because it was very important because Minneapolis St. Paul has one of the la largest Cambodian communities in the nation and full of a lot of refugees and there's a lot of problems intergenerational communication problems between the uh, parents who were, and grandparents who were refugees here and the young people who were going to school. So we also made it our focus to be able to work with all, an all Cambodian cast. And we had um, people that were from the Royal Ballet, which Absar dancers who had taken refugee here. We had musicians who had um, worked their entire life as musicians. They in fact survived by playing um, to, to entertain. And then we had young people who really didn't know what had happened. Um, and it, it became a remarkable uh, cross collaboration in which I think the music, because we used found objects for the music considering everything was destroyed. So we had no true instruments. All the instruments we had were things that we could find that could sound like those instruments. Um, and, and to me, I think it was one of the greatest ways of using music because I, I personally love theater that transforms and transports. And I think music gets us out of our heads and gets us into a place of listening and being that awakens our spirit. And so to me, that's my main purpose because I am a music whore <laughs> for my theater and, and a sound whore a technical, from a technical point of view because I think that is viscerally uh, takes people somewhere else. And I think that's what it did with Chris Ongtree. It was really beautiful to see grandparents performing with their grandchildren and the grandchildren learning traditional dance but mixing it with what they did contemporary. And that's kind of... I made it short because we don't have a lot of time. Yeah, and the beautiful thing was that, that it opened this dialogue because there were several, uh, you know, intergenerational. It was a range from 11, I think, to uh, Boon Lung, who was a renowned uh, musician. And as Mary Beth said, he survived the Khmer Rouge because he could play Vietnamese music, and they loved Vietnamese music. I mean, think about the parallels of, of that, right? Um, and, and that's their Holocaust, right? Um, so, um, but some of the, it, it opened a dialogue because many parents were afraid to even talk about. Well, we the, had some people um, that wouldn't participate because they were afraid of being um, retribution uh, against them from the Khmer Rouge that lived in Minneapolis, St. Paul yeah. also. So and they were afraid to participate because of that. But Usamur's whole uh, ethos in, in writing his poetry in it is to, to, to talk about this and the, the experience. And it was really critical to him. He said, because we don't bring this to the light of day, if we don't go through this, if we don't we tell this piece, the then he talks a lot about the cycles of history and the wheel of history will turn again on us. So, so it was a, it, it, that I think was one of the most amazing things, other, other, in addition to having an opportunity to, to partner with these amazing musicians and dancers, but that this dialogue, an intergenerational dialogue opened up and, and it really accomplished what I think Usamor was th thinking about in a broader um, sense, not just in, in creating a piece of theater that was beautiful, but in his mission as a, as a poet and an artist. Mm -hmm. Kim has to say one more small thing. A small thing, and, and you can feel free to approach me if you want to hear more about it, but I also worked a lot with the talking, I work a lot with the Talking Band Theater Company and the composer Ellen Maddow in New York City, and mm. she's very much inspired by Meredith Monk, mm. who, um, for those of you who don't know her, is avant-garde vocalist, came up in the 60s and does a lot of a cappella mm -hmm. vocal stuff. And um, so that, that's a way to incorporate music into your play that will help forward the scenes along, whether you want lyrics or no. So f just for a quick example, say you have a rainy scene and you would like a little music that would help serve that scene. Um, in Meredith Monk, Ellen Maddow style, you would have vocals, um, someone going bleep, blah, bleep, 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 you know, that kind of thing. So if anyone <laughs> wants to hear, hear more about that, you know, feel free to approach me. Um, we only have a few minutes left. Um, so does anyone have any questions that they would like to come up and ask? You have to take, I was told, the long 
walk up to the mic. Oh, we're quiet today. <laughs> Ruth, is there anything else you would like to say? Um, well, I guess I, I would say in terms of uh, cross-cultural um, projects, there have been a lot in my um, experience, but I, I would talk about Fred, the work that I've done with Fred Ho because um, he really brought together martial artists from all different schools of uh, kung fu and um, capoeira and, and um, all kind. They actually would have their own schools and they mm -hmm. would come and work together and um, do theater. And it was amazing to see them on stage together because they were trained to fight and so they had to learn how to do theater and not hurt each other and you know <laughs> so it was an amazing thing to watch their styles um, influence each other and come together as um, as a whole piece and there's a um, a kind of parallel in one of the storylines that Fred and I wrote which is the five martial artists of uh, Shaolin Temple who all have different fighting styles, you know, whether it's panther or um, uh, snake style or their different styles. And then when they go to fight the um, evil Garman Zhang who has stolen the, the Shaolin secret scro scrolls and absorbed all of the fighting styles into her body, um, they have to improvise. So I really love that. Um, idea of for cross-cultural collaboration that um, that I think Mark is speaking to too because I think uh, when you think of culture you think of traditions and um, conventions of music or theater and I think that's really wonderful but at one time those conventions were also improv improvisational and mm -hmm. so to keep that spirit um, which comes also from the avant-garde and the edge that continues to move um, wherever it will um, is uh, to just keep exploring and to not be bound by the um, conventions of the past because I think we're always working towards a new future with also respect for the traditions that you are um, working with. And I always think of that as, um, um, I spoke to this a little bit yesterday, but I think of myself as taking off my shoes when I walk in the room. Like mm -hmm. I, I, it's sort of holy ground mm -hmm. in a way. And um, if I, th I think of community and another w thing that I didn't, didn't get to say yesterday is that um, there's a song at the end of Three Graces, a piece that I wrote where mm. it's talking about, um, it's a tavern song and it's sit down at my table, have the drink the same old wine. There's a palace we can plunder. There's a life that should be mine. But this, this is my tavern, this is my table. And they're singing this as the, um, uh, to the Turk and the Greek rebels are fighting to the death. And I think in this, in collaboration, you have to sometimes say, this is not my table. This is not my play. This is not mine. It's all, it belongs to all of us. And I think that's sort of something I'm always trying to learn and also um, teach. So that's maybe something to think about. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Um, if there are no questions, I think we've reached the end of our time. So th thank you, everyone, for listening to us. And, and go out and make some wild music. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you.